Hello, everyone. Am I Hello, everybody. Um, we are uh, having uh, difficulties with the audio from Tasha R. So we're going to do something unusual. I'm going to be both the MC and the the host and the answer on this podcast. Um, we're live, so um, you know, crazy things are going to happen even more. So I, I would ask that you go ahead and start putting comments, questions you have in the comments section, and I'll get to that. There's a couple of questions that Tasha R had set up for me to answer first to kind of get the, the juices flowing here. Um, but I'm gonna, he's gonna post questions in a private chat to me, the ones I need to answer from his perspective, and then I'm gonna get to you, because this is all about the audience. And um, the best part of doing these sessions isn't hearing me blither and blather about what I've done, it's understanding what questions you have about what I've written about so that I can learn and we can form a conversation. So let me start off with the very first question. Right? Why did I write this book? What was my motivation for this book? I mean, I just had finished the, the, the economics of data analytics and digital transformation, which was, which was really um, has been a very um, useful book for me in talking to executives about how they reframe their conversation, especially business executives, how they reframe their thinking about data and analytics, not as technology assets, but as economic assets. And the book covers all kinds of economic theorems and it's got, it's a very pragmatic approach, you know, step one, step two, and how organizations can take advantage of the deep, you know, embedded insights or these coded and predictable propensities that are buried in the data, propensities and predicted propensities about your, your customers, your services, your products, your operations, right? Blah, blah, blah. All very business oriented, very rah, rah, you know, make money, life is good sort of thing. Then I write this book. Why? Well, there's a story behind it and there's kind of a kick in the butt behind it. So I had moved from Palo Alto, where I'd been, spent basically nearly 40 years of my life, had moved to back to Iowa, where I'm from and my wife is from and where we have family. Um, it was kind of the next step in my, my life journey. And I came here with the hope professionally of bringing AI more to Iowa. I mean, when you're in Palo Alto, you know, you sit in a coffee shop, everybody's talking about AI. You go to a you go to a you know social thing. It's like everywhere, right? And so I thought I wanted to bring that same sort of energy, and um, to the to Iowa as well. So by the way, introduce myself. Who I am? Uh, my name is Bill Schmarzo. They uh, they nickname me the Dean of Big Data. I spent um, I'm a, I'm the customer innovation lead at Dell Technologies. But in my spare time, I also teach at universities. I'm associated with uh, the University of San Francisco as an executive fellow. I'm associated with the National University of Ireland in, in Galway as an honorary professor. And I'm teaching at Iowa State and Co College here in Iowa. So um, very active in that. Um, I've written several books. I've written the big data. I've written Big Data NBA. I wrote a book called The Art of Thinking Like a Data Scientist, which is kind of the heart of my classes I teach. My fourth book was this economics of data analytics and digital transformation. I like to joke that my kids said that the only way I could make this book sound more boring was to somehow weasel the word Brussels sprouts in there or something, right? So that was my fourth book. And I thought it was my last book. I really did. And then I had this experience. I came back to Iowa and I was very fortunate that I had been here not more than a month and I ran into some people and I explained my background. They said, oh, you have to come to this this." this workshop we're doing. We're bringing together 100 and 120 of some of the leading thinkers in central Iowa. And, you know, they come from government, they come from university, they come from social, they come from corporations and all kinds of different perspectives, universities and such, right? And we're trying to figure out what does central Iowa need to focus in on? There are, there are 45 issues they wanted to sort of triage and they wanted to look at these 45 issues and they wanted to basically figure out from these 45 issues, you see this two by two matrix here, which is kind of similar. They wanted to figure out which of these things were real, things that they needed to be concerned about and what their impact would be on Iowa. One of those topics was AI. And so they broke us into 10 groups and we brainstormed and we talked about these 45 different things very quickly and our job was to sort of figure out where in this chart from is it real and is it is it viable for iowa where this thing sits out of those 10 groups only one 
group put AI in the, it's viable and it's important to us. And that one group, by the way, was my group, which meant that outside of my group, none of the other groups either didn't feel that I, AI was real or AI wasn't relevant for a state where AI is going to impact agriculture and manufacturing and healthcare and insurance and financial services and education. Right? It was, it, I was, I left that that workshop stunned, dumbfounded by what I saw. That that there was not. Isn't these people were dumb? They're not. They're brilliant. They're really smart. They're very creative. But this whole AI thing seems so foreign to them, and they didn't think it was relevant to them. But I thought I, I think I found my calling. That I need to figure out how to bring something. How do I raise the awareness? Yeah, you know the the parts of the country like the Silicon Valley and Seattle and Boston and Austin. These places, you know, they people are breathing and 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 living this AI stuff. But there's lots of parts of our country and lots of parts of our world that don't really understand what AI is about and what it could do, the impact it could have. So after attending that that session and scratching my head like I'm doing now, I, I wrote a, a, a two-part series on AI and data literacy. And what are the components? If if my personal goal, my personal mission is to try to elevate the awareness of AI and how everybody can benefit from it, what are the different components of it? So I wrote this two-part blog and I was surprised by the conversations I had with people through LinkedIn on the, after I published those blogs that were not the typical people I had conversations with. They were, they were people who were on the business side or not in technology, better description. They were not in technology and they were like this AI thing. I, I don't understand it. I don't what it, know what it means to me. I don't understand what my role needs to be and, and what can I do to make sure it's being done for, for good. So that was the motivation that led, that led to this. The, the experience of the, the lack of awareness and understanding outside of a few small pockets, the fact that people were very interested, concerned, eager to learn more about this. And so, so I jumped into it and um, wrote the book. Now, one of the questions on here is, um, you know, what, what chapter am I most proud of? Well, let me, let me, just two things here, right? The chapter I'm probably most proud of is the chapter on AI, where I actually spent a lot of time thinking about why is AI, especially as reflected by something like reinforcement learning, how and why is that different from traditional analytics? You know, traditional analytics like multivariate regression analysis or association rules or clustering or anything like, right? There's, there's, a, it's a, there's a distinct difference between the analytics we've done in the past and the analytics we're likely to do more in the future Leveraging this this capability, of, like with reinforcement learning, to continuously learn and adapt, and that was the key point, is that a lot of the traditional analytics, which gets put under the umbrella of AI, because it's you know a marketing term, so everything is AI, right? If I got an abacus, that's that's AI, right, folks? But these traditional analytics, like I, I like multivariate regression analysis, probably one of the most popular analytic tools in the world, right? It's not what makes multivariate regression analysis so powerful, and those traditional tools so powerful, is that they are optimization analytics in my perspective. That is, I can use those analytics to optimize my inventory, optimize my marketing campaigns, optimize my customer retention, right? They're great at optimizing use cases. What makes AI really different is it's not an optimization analytics, it's a continuously learning and adapting analytics. It's a learning analytics that the more it interacts, the more it's learning. And the critical importance of defining this, what I call the, it's called the AI utility function, which is this beating heart of the AI model. The importance of properly defining a healthy AI utility function is critical to getting AI to deliver meaningful, relevant, responsible, and ethical outcomes. And to achieve that, we need to involve everybody. Everybody needs to be understand what their role is. This is why this term citizen is so important. That there, you, you can't sit passively back. That to, to embrace AI 
as a citizen of data science. John Morley, who gave me a wonderful quote, John Morley and I fight constantly. And John, I hope you're on the phone here or on this thing because you know that you and I fight. But John gave me, it's in the book, it's on chap, it's on page uh, 11. What does it mean to be a citizen? I'm going to read this directly. I think this is a marvelous quote about being a citizen. Citizenship isn't something that is bestowed upon you by an external benevolent force. Citizenship requires action. Citizenship requires stepping up. Citizenship requires individual and collective accountability. Accountability to continuously, to a continuous awareness, learning, and adaption. Citizenship is about having a proactive and meaningful stake in building a better world. So when I talk about being a citizen of data science, I don't mean, yeah, you're going to learn some analytic techniques. You're going to learn about multivariate regression. You're going to learn about neural networks. You're going to learn blah, blah, blah. You're going to learn some statistics. Blah. The most important thing is this. You are a citizen. You must be involved in this process. You need to be in process, which brings me back to what do I think is my favorite chapter? It's clearly chapter nine. And at the end of chapter nine on page 167, right, I've got it highlighted, I was thinking about the importance of empowerment. Chapter nine is about empowerment. Because if you have all the other components, if I have, you think about the, the, the um, AI and data literacy components, there's you know, data and privacy awareness. You need to understand sort of what data is and what data privacy is about. Um, there is the understanding AI and analytic techniques. There's how to make better decisions. There's some basics about predictions and statistics. And there's some, how do I create value all built around a foundation of ethics, right? That's kind of the foundation. That's your, that's your training, that's your education you know, curriculum. But around that, you need to surround empowerment. You need to make sure that everybody is empowered. And, and I'm getting a note that I probably should move on to questions because I could rant and rave, but it, I'm gonna challenge you to go to page 167. And there are 15 points about what it means to be empowered. And that those 15 points flew off my fingers. That's why I read the whole book and I thought, there's something missing. And it was those 15 points. So I'm gonna give you a challenge I want you to find those 15 points. I want you to tell me which of those 15 points you think are most important and get back to me. So anyway, time for some questions. I'm gonna to go to, um, to the, um, ah, okay, I got a question here. Um, please explain responsible AI in short. So um, pretend I'm like chat GPT or Bing. And so you want me to explain responsible AI. Responsible AI means leveraging AI to make decisions that take into account not only confirmation bias, but also the potential unintended consequences of the decisions that those AI models are delivering. Right? We're, we're, we're very good at building, leveraging AI to deliver meaningful and relevant results. You get recommendations on what books to read. You get recommendations on you know, what, what restaurants to go to or what products to buy or who to date. But we need to add to that the ability to deliver responsible and ethical outcomes. So responsible AI in short is thinking through, how do I make sure that I've engineered my AI models who can continuously learn and adapt, that they're basically learning and adapting from the models you know, false positive and false negative, so I can mitigate the ramifications of AI confirmation bias. So I can make sure that my models aren't being skewed to um, to penalize protected classes. And then there's unintended consequences. Yes, we need to make sure that we have built AI models. We have built AI this AI utility function in a way that we can monitor for and mitigate and avoid unintended consequences, which is really, really hard because it takes it takes a village to go through a process to IDA, IDA that. So it wasn't a short answer, but it's really thinking about how do I make sure I avoid confirmation bias in the, in the model so I'm not, I'm not prejudiced against protected classes? And how do I make certain that I've thought through carefully the unintended consequences? Because if I don't do that, remember AI, AI is going to make decisions billions of times faster than us. And it can, it can easily optimize us right out of business. All right. Hope that answers the question. Next question, let's see. Um, so I have a question about, do you, do you touch upon machine learning concepts and implementation? So I, um, 
the book is not designed to be a technology book. There, there are a lot of marvelous books that PAC puts together and puts out that people have written around machine learning concepts and implementation, how to do it properly, et cetera. What I do talk about is that everybody needs to understand what are these different technologies do? What are they capable of doing? And what should I, how should I use them? Right? I don't expect you to write a neural network, for example, out of this book. That wouldn't be practical for the average person. But the average person should understand what a deep learning or neural network product does. Right? And Algon, how does it work? And what kind of uses can I use for it? So while I don't necessarily touch upon you know, machine learning from an implementation perspective, again, there's a lot of better books out there. Um, I do from the fact that I want everybody to be aware of these things. And I want them to be aware so that they're not afraid of these things, so they understand how these things work and how they're being used so they can be in thoughtful conversations regarding is that the right way to be using those kind of analytics. So I hope that answered your question. So uh, another one, okay. Ah, thank you, Paul. Would AI be good for North Yorkshire? It's an agriculture area in, north, in the north of England. So let me ask you this. Here's a good test, Paul. This is a good question. It's a good test. Would AI be relevant? Okay. Is it relevant for, for you to make better decisions? That's really how we're using AI and all the different advanced analytics. We're trying to leverage, we have a we have a wealth of data. Some of that data is not valuable at all, but some of it is. And we're trying to figure out how do we leverage analytics to mine through that data so I can make better decisions regarding my agriculture. Like for example, what crops to plant and how to do crop rotations and when to harvest. And you know, there are tons of decisions made around you know, the machinery that you work in the crops and the staff you have to do that and, and such. So there, if you think about all the decisions that you need to make in order to optimize or improve the, you know, the agricultural output of the north of, of North Yorkshire, there are all kinds of places where data and analytics can have value. Now, it may not necessarily be reinforcement learning. You can get a lot of value, as I said earlier, from something like multivariate regression analysis and clustering analysis and association rules. So uh, having an understanding of these different tools that are available to me, I got a hammer, I got a saw, I got a cut saw, I got a backhoe, right? What problem am I trying to solve? That is, what decisions am I trying to make? What are my desired outcomes? What are the KPIs the metrics against which I'm going to measure the effectiveness of those outcomes? Gives me a lots of clues as far as what data might, do I think I'm going to need and what analytic tools am I going to need to sort of use to, to uncover those insights buried in the data? So good question. And hopefully it's, you can see that AI and analytics is relevant for anybody who's trying to make decisions. All right. AI can be used in nearly any industry at any level. Expe exactly. And AI is bigger than some machine learning or chat GPT. Yeah, let's let's go down this chat GPT thing for a second. It's you know, the funny thing is I was writing this book and I'm near the very end, getting close, and this chat GPT thing just explodes on us. And it causes all kinds of angst. And we've got people in Washington, DC saying, shut down the AI models because here come the terminators and all kinds of crazy stuff's going on. Um Chat GPT and generative AI and large language models, what I do talk about in the book. I added a chapter on here to, to make people aware of what these things can do. I did a real brief on some underlying technology so people aren't, this is not magic, right? It's not chat, the generative AI is not magic. So you need to understand what it does. And then I use that, I use generative AI as a way to test out some of the, there is a, there is a, um, um, a radar chart in here of all the different uh, components and it asks you to measure how uh, how effective are you at AI and data literacy? What are your skill sets? And I, I use chat generative AI as another vehicle to test it out. Generative, what I love about generative AI is that it has overnight increased everybody's awareness of AI. Now, it may not be a rational awareness in some cases, but that's okay. We start with awareness and then we start educating. And that is really where we all need to be. This, this book is, seeks to do that, but it, the book alone won't do that. It requires all of us to become citizens, to get involved in those conversations, to make certain that we have a voice in the process and that we are bringing others to the table as well. So a great point. AI is, is, is bigger than just machine learning. It's, it's got huge potential. We, 
We're still figuring it all out um, as a society. There's a lot of learning to go, but we all need to be involved in that. You can't delegate your responsibility in this area to others. Greetings from London. Howdy. Um, oh, a quote from Plato. I love it already. A good decision is based on knowledge, not on numbers. Ah, a, a good decision is based on knowledge, not on numbers. I, I agree with that. Um, I do think that the numbers can help us apply our knowledge more accurately and that numbers can help us in in, in moving our knowledge to make certain that our knowledge is being applied to a decision in a most effective way. Um, this reminds me of something I tell my students in my class. Um, I'm teaching second year MBA students and um, I encourage them to use chat GPT and Bing and Barb in the class. Um, because I say, here's the days when we would reward people on their ability to memorize and regurgitate knowledge is over. Let me say that again. The age when we reward people for memorizing and regurgitating knowledge is over. Where we're entering is the age where we're going to reward those people who know how to apply knowledge. Right? How do I take knowledge? How do I take data and analytics to augment my knowledge so I can apply it to make better decisions? So I do think that play, that Plato is right, and I do think what it actually boils down to is that good decisions is based on the application, right, of knowledge that can be bolstered, enhanced by the insights buried inside the data. And by the way, let's talk about data for a second. I know it's not one of the questions yet, but you know, data in of itself has zero value. Let's be really clear. Data has zero value. What's important in the data are these predicted behavioral and performance insights about your products, your services, your operations, your, you know, your employees, your customers, right, your key entities, and the application of those insights to make better decisions. So having data is a starting point, but not sufficient. Uncovering insights is a good next step, but insufficient. But if you're not applying that to, to make more relevant, meaningful, responsible, and ethical decisions, then you are failing. Thanks for the question. Is augmented analytics the same as AI analytics? That's interesting. Um, in my book, I have I have a chart in here where I talk about um, how we can leverage analytics to to augment human decision making, human intelligence is like augmented human intelligence (AHI), um, which is you know leveraging a lot of traditional analytics to do that. I believe that. AI brings forward this idea of autonomous analytics, that it can learn on its own, learn and adapt with minimal human intervention. And that that will also help us to become, you know, make intelligent decisions. But I do try to separate what I think is augmented intelligence from using traditional analytics to, you know, autonomous intelligence or autonomous analytics that are continuously learning and adapting with minimal human intervention. So I, I hope that hope that makes sense. Good question. I love these questions, by the way. Paul's back. I love it. Paul, you're you're going to be heard. I'm a counselor on the local council, and I would like us to make better decisions about how we get ready for climate change, yet add food security, energy security, and public health. Ah, you have hit at one of the hearts of building an AI, a healthy AI utility function. Right? If you think about as humans, when we make decisions, we are constantly making trade-offs between a number of different variables. You know, even a decision as far as, you know, where to go eat, we're trading off distance and the quality of food and the price. Some of us look at, you know, organic, <coughs> excuse me, or, you know, direct from the farm sort of stuff. So as humans, we're always making these trade-off decisions Right, we're always looking at these two variables to make a trade-off system what we're going to do. And by the way, the decision we make today about where we're going to eat will, may very well be different than the decision we make next week. Because 
variables are going to change. The environment's going to change. Our intentions are going to change. Things are going to change. What I love about your question, Paul, is that climate change, food security, energy security, public health, and full employment, education, you know, um, energy independence, these are all variables that need to be brought into the mix. There is no optimization across those. But I, what I mean by there is like no one right answer is that you're going to constantly be making trade-offs about we're going to do this. To, it's going to, you know, you're, you're going to do this that adds positive here, but it might be a negative here for this particular situation. But as you learn, as the environment changes, you're going to be constantly changing as what you know, the weights inside the variables that are going to change the decisions it makes. Because the decision it makes today may not be the right decision it makes next week or next month. And so building conflict into your AI utility function and forcing your AI model to have to make trade-off decisions is critical for making certain that we get AI models that deliver responsible and ethical outcomes. That it constantly is learning and adapting based on the decisions it makes, based on the environment it operates in, right? To, to always seeking to make the right decision given that situation, knowing very well that that decision may not be the right decision next time. <laughs> I, Paul, they know where they can find me because here I am in a box right here. I'm easy to find. Thank you, Paul. This is a, this is one of the, Am I audible now? Is that uh, what I'm Sorry. I'm not, you're not hearing me? Am I? Hopefully, okay. I'm going to assume people can hear me. This is a good question. This is the heart of one of the challenges of AI. You think bias can be absolutely removed by technical means from AI solutions? Let me answer that first, first, first part. No. Here's the problem with bias. Couple of problems. First off, bias and preferences are very tricky. They really, they really are very fine line between what's a bias and what's a preference. For example, I like the Chicago Cubs better than the Chicago White Sox. Is that a bias or is that a preference? So when what we find is when we start talking about bias is we get, start talking about are we making decisions based on protected classes, you know, gender, race, um, age, other areas, right? And so there's going to always be some level of bias in the data that we need to contend with. Now, what I do believe we can do, sort of to sort of get down to the next question here, is if we can engineer our models so that we are flagging and learning from the false positives and the false negatives of those models, then we can actually use the AI models to help us manage and counteract confirmation bias. Let me give you an example. So you got a model that's hiring people and your model is trying to hire people that maps to what you think are good performers. And hopefully your, your, your variables you're using have taken out not only the protected class variables but any proxies for those, right? You've got those eliminated. Right, so your your model's learning. It makes decisions to hire somebody. Right, hires people that thinks they're going to work great, ignores people that doesn't think they're going to work great. Okay, there's two cases. False positive. You hire somebody you think's going to be just absolutely great, and they fan out. Right? They don't work out. They blow up. Okay. You want to learn from the fact that you thought your model predicted this person was going to do well, and they didn't. So I need to take the information about that person. You know, all the information that was fed into the model in the first place and feed that back in, right? I'm looking at their performance reviews, looking at their, you know, their CV, looking at any projects they did. I want to be able to take this thing so the model can learn from somebody who I thought was going to be great, but didn't work out. So the model can learn from the false positives. Actually, not that hard because your systems capture a lot of the performance data, a lot of their project data, you've got their CV and their HR system, you've got a lot of data. So false positives is actually one of the things that you can work back into your model so it's constantly learning and adapting and getting smarter. Great. False negatives. The person you didn't hire, the person you didn't give a loan to, the person you didn't admit to a college. How do you learn from the false positives? Majority of people say, well, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna wash my hands of that. Now you're gonna get into confirmation bias. If you're not learning from the actions you did not take, 
then you open the door for confirmation bias. Let's go back to this hiring thing. So what are, how do I find, how do I track somebody that interviewed for a job, I didn't give them a job? How do I track their success? This is where human ingenuity becomes and kicks in, right? We can track their performance. We can track their performance on LinkedIn and other social media factors. You could, you could call them. You could set up surveys. You could follow this person to find out exactly you know, where they went. And if they end up having a successful career or you know, having success, feed what you've learned about them back into your model so your models are learning from the false positives and the false negatives. And that'll help you to overcome some of the confirmation bias if you've created that feedback loop. Right, so we're not making decisions, but you know, but actually feeding back. Anyway, I know I spent too much time on that question, so um, I need a drink here. Um, I wish there was something more than coffee in this. It says, "Hi, Bill. From a data privacy point of view, is the present technology capable of unlearning data that should not have been used in training a model?" Wow. Good question. Unlearning data. So if we build a model that's not right, that's that's delivering the wrong kind of results, either it's not relevant or meaningful or responsible or ethical, you're probably going to actually build a lot of models like that. That's okay. Data science is a discipline of learning through failure. And so this idea of unlearning, of learning of unlearning what the model the model you built and how wrong it was, triage it to try to figure out which of the variables in there were, were relevant and which ones were not, and then battling back. These are saddle points in the data science process, right? You, at some point in time, your data your, your data models just can't be made any better. And sometimes you got to go back and start over. Learn from what you did, learn from what went wrong, unlearn what you said, and you may have to start from scratch. Not entirely from scratch. You, you can learn from what you failed at doing, because it is a failure-centric thing. But I, I think it's really critical, not just from a data privacy perspective, but in the ability to deliver models that deliver relevant and responsible and ethical results, so we understand that a model is only a model, right? It's only going to give you a probability of success. It's not absolute. And so these models over time have to be constantly retrained and retuned. Why? Because the world changes. And the model was built at a certain point in time to reflect a certain point of nature in the world. And the world changes, and those models need to be tweaked. Sometimes you can build feedback loops so the models can sometimes manage their own drift. A lot of times, though, it requires the data science team, the data engineering team, the AI specialists to get in and say, let's figure out how we tweak this model to make it better. It's called the Full-Time Data Scientist Employment Act, so it's a good life to be in. But I do think the importance of realizing that unlearning is going to become as important as learning if you're going to be a citizen of data science. No questions? I can't believe that. You're going to go back to Bill Schmarzo asking himself questions? Oh, so we have a drawing, I guess. I should check my notes, private chat. Oh, we're going to do a giveaway. Mayor, congratulations. Now, there's going to be a second drawing, folks. So if you put into the chat, hashtag PACT, P-A-C-K-T, you have a chance to win as well. By the way, a lot of familiar names I saw rippling through that. That was great. Um, so, yeah, so there's still time to go ahead and get qualified for the second giveaway. Hashtag PACT, put it in the comments, and um, we'll go from there. Thanks, Matt. Matthew, I appreciate it. I I um, I, I got to be careful here, so let me be careful. We we tend sometimes to let marketing dictate technology when we should really rely on how we apply it to dictate where we're going with it. I'll just I'll stop there. You know what I'm saying, I think, Matthew, that. Um, that yeah, very well said. Your data, information, wisdom, knowledge, knowledge, wisdom. This is we're all on this journey together, folks. You know, I may have written the book, quote unquote, but 
a lot of people on this line are people who I talk to frequently. And your ideas, your thoughts, your feedback are throughout this book. I mean, I gotta be honest with you, I'm not that smart. What I'm good at is I'm observant. And when I can see people asking lots of the same questions, I just write them down. And I think, well, how do we solve that problem? And people smarter than me have ideas. How do we correct? How do we handle you know, false positives and false negatives? How do we approach learning from unintended consequences? So um, we're all in this together. This is a journey. But I, what I really want to make sure that comes through in this journey is it can't be a journey just for the few. It must be a journey for everyone. We must make sure everybody has a chance to have a voice in this process. And if we do that, we'll end up with AI models that really do help us and help humanity. Because let's face it, humanity is facing a lot of crappy problems right now. We're not doing a very good job of addressing some of these problems. We can certainly use AI. And I think in the end, what I think is going to be surprising about what we learn from our journey here is that AI ultimately will make us more human. And what I mean by that is that AI is going to force us to leverage what we believe, what we what is a natural human strength, which is curiosity. AI is going to force us to be curious again, to curious and explore. We've, as a society, I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but we've done a lot in our society to wipe creativity out of our students, of our employees, Right, we have, think about our students, standardized classes and standardized curriculums and standardized tests and standardized, everything is standardized. We're all standardized. We go to corporations where we have standardized job rules and standardized organizational charts and standardized job descriptions and standardized project plans. Everything is standardized. Standardized is the world of what AI is going to dominate. What we need to be doing is fueling that natural human curiosity to explore, to try, to fail, learn, unlearn and try again. So I, I again, I, I believe that in my heart that AI ultimately will force us to be more human. And that'll allow us to get to our roots, especially if we start talking about ethics and delivering responsible outcomes. All right, back to comments. Unless you want me to keep chatting, folks. Hey, Richard, thanks for the, thanks for the question. What concerns do you have about the results of iterative AI becoming the learning material for The human in a loop might just blindly trust the outcomes. Ah, Richard, I knew you'd ask a good question. Thank you, by the way, for being a part of this session today and asking a question. Critical thinking, topic I cover in the book, is more important than ever. And we know, as Richard's point here, is that generative AI has the potential to build upon itself, to take lie upon lie or misstatement or inaccurate statement to inaccurate statement and cascade that. We are learning, for example, the hard way about the, the lack of critical thinking in social media, for example. And I think what, what's happened in social media, an unregulated unleashing of opinions as fact that had this cascading effect that Richard talked about here, and that the human in the loop just blindly trusts whatever came out on social media that we lost the ability to think critically about what was being said. And the results, I think, have been very questionable beyond the scope of this, but within the scope of several beers sometime when you're with me. The good news here is I think because of our awareness of the potential areas where AI can go wrong, that critical thinking is going to become more important than ever, that when we use the generative AI products, that we are using it as a research assistant, not as a source of fact. It's help. I'm, I'm doing an exercise right now where I'm taking my thinking like a data scientist methodology, my approach for my students who have gone through this class with me, including some corporate customers. I'm integrating Gen AI into that process. And it's been eye-opening about how I can leverage Gen AI to make my process more effective, more quick, but it also does not replace the need for you as a human to think. It gives me answers. Some of them are, let's say 80%, 70% kind of cor correct. There's some that are totally wrong. They just got to throw out, right? But I can throw things out that I know aren't right. And I can ask it questions to help 
push new areas that I have a curiosity on that it may not give me the exact answer on. In fact, it seldom gives me the exact answer. In fact, it never gives me the exact answer. But it fuels my curiosity to explore. And that's what we need this, this tool to do, that we still have to embrace critical thinking. We still have to think for ourselves. We still have to think, does that make sense? So we ask the question, what's the source of that? And then investigate the source. Is that a peer reviewed source? Or is that a source from some wacko and sitting in the, the hills of Wyoming or something and making crap up, right? No, you gotta think for yourself. This does not replace that. So thanks for the question, Richard. Good, good question. Hey, Kevin, this, this is a good, I just saw this video. I haven't watched it yet. This is a really interesting video. What about explainable AI? Um, the goal is to use physics to understand neural networks. So I don't know the answer to this one, Kevin, but I, I just saw this, I, this, this link was shared with me. I'm anxious to look at it. I do think that one of the problems of neural nets is the black box effect, that we aren't certain how the variables are, um, are being used to create a score of what that might be or make a decision. So I don't know much about this, to be honest with you. Um, I do think it's, that it's critical that we are using models where somebody can say, can you explain to me why the system made that choice? And I can look at the variables that were used and the weights of those variables to explain, we made this decision because of these following variables and their weights. We need to get there with neural networks too. But interesting, Kevin, it may not be for all use cases. For example, if I'm looking at CAT scans, trying to determine if somebody has a tumor or not, do I really need to understand the rationale for how it figured out that that was a tumor and that was not? I mean, I know it's it's probably important, I'm not a medical person, so maybe that's important for their doctor, but I know from an output perspective that its ability to identify things more accurately, I may not be able to figure out how, you know, how does it know that that's a cat from a you know from a dog you know i so i'm not sure in all cases i need to have explainability in my neural networks but i do need to have explainability i guess in situations where where people are potentially being negatively impacted which i guess maybe is the case for looking at, at cat scans to make certain that that actually is a tumor and not just you know a smudge or something i don't know the answer kevin but i'm going to certainly check out max's video i think it looks interesting what are your thoughts on EU's approach to regulating AI? Good topic, good question. Um, the, and from my impression, the, U, the EU is right now catching a lot of crap because they're being very meticulous about how they're applying it. <clears throat> I just read an article that said, no, are, is the EU actually getting behind because they're letting the rest of the world run rampant and the EU's taking a very methodical approach. And it kind of reminds me of the hare and the tortoise race, right? Um, sometimes the hare wins, sometimes the hare runs right off the cliff. That's more like a Bugs Bunny, I guess, sort of thing, and the coyote. I think the EU's approach makes a total amount of sense here, that they're looking at this in a very systematic, regulated process. The GDPR was, was clearly, the, the, in my opinion, one of the very first thoughtful applications about how we're going to leverage protecting people's personal data and privacy. And I think this approach is a right approach. Now, what I also like is I like the fact that the EU is doing it this way, the US is doing it this way, somebody else is doing it this way. We're all gonna try these different ways. Which ones work out the best? Which ones end up with the most responsible and ethical outcomes? So on the servers, I think EU's approach is, is, makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know if it's the right one, but we won't know if it's the right one if we don't let them run with it and see what they do with it. Sorry, cough, cough, cough. How do we address the fact that how humans use algorithms to create unattended consequences? Thanks, Dan. We might optimize for revenue, but create less innovation because of what we're doing. So let me, let's talk about unattended consequences because that's a real issue. And I'm, I'm less concerned about the algorithms creating unattended consequences as I am about our leaders making policy decisions without going through a process to ideate what the potential unattended consequences might be and how do we identify the variables and metrics against which we can monitor to mitigate those situations. The, the algorithms to me aren't the problem. If I put in the right variables and metrics, I can get algorithms to do the right things. 
my problem is we have leaders in our in our world, most of them political, who make these decisions and they don't think through the second, third, and fourth order ramifications of those decisions. And they cause all kinds of angst. And so what I recently did a presentation to a board of directors and we talked about the unintended consequences. And um, in the book, I, I have a <coughs> design template that sort of talks about how do we go about brainstorming these unintended consequences? How do we go through to not only brainstorm what they might be, but identify the KPIs and metrics against which we can use to monitor that. Because those KPIs and metrics very well might end up being in your AI utility function. To do that brainstorming, that ideating of all the potential unintended consequences isn't something the executives of Mahogany Row are gonna figure out. It's the people at the front line. The front line's a customer engagement and operational execution. Those are the people you need to bring in the process. They're the ones who are going to see this and say, you know, that's a great idea, except it's going to have a ripple effect here. It's going to cause this. I'm seeing this in some decisions that are being made here in the state of Iowa. And the ripple effect that decisions being made by the governor is having on my hometown, for example, which is a very small town here in Iowa that I grew up in. And so we, when we make decisions as leaders, we owe it to our constituents to go through a process to bring together diverse perspectives and think through what could go wrong. So we identify those KPIs and metrics around which we're going to um, measure and mitigate those unintended consequences. By the way, while you get the next question up, it does make a good, a, good, a good point here. It's actually one of the points in my, um, my, in my empowerment, that we're empowered to confront and synergize not to run away and sulk when you don't like what you hear. We need to embrace diversity. Diversity of perspectives, not diversity of opinions, but diversity of perspectives and their rationales behind those perspectives are critical. If as a society, we're gonna go from compromising on the least worst option where the loudest voice gets their way to synergizing on the best, best option where we take the best nuggets out of what everybody brings and we blend them and bend them together to create something more powerful, right? We, when you run away from diversity, you run away from learning. And if we want to learn and grow, we must embrace diversity. Anyway, that's kind of one of the things I wanna highlight in the book. How do we change the education system to focus on critical thinking? Um, I'm actually working with a uh, local um, school district here on, on that very subject, Dan. And what's I'm finding interesting is the students who are, who are younger, obviously because they're students, they, they take to this stuff right away. If you show them, if you educate, make them aware of how they're being, dis, being um, influenced um, in ways that may not be beneficial to them. If you make them aware of how organizations are using data and analytics and other vehicles to persuade them to do things that may not be in their best interest, these students pick these concepts up quickly. They're, they're really smart, right? They're really smart. And, and, and getting to our, into our education system sooner, the importance of critical thinking is critical, duh, right? Critical thinking is critical. And, but I think our students we don't give them enough credit. We, we, in a, us old dogs, we look back on the younger people. We think, oh, they didn't have it tough. I, when I went to school. I had to walk up the hill. I had to walk up a hill to get to school and walk up a hill to get back home, right? That's not what these people are about. They're smart. They're very aware. And I think it's up to us as the, sometimes some of us kind of being the senior generation to reach back and to mentor and to help that or the, the people coming up, understanding the dangers and challenges out there because we've lived them. We've gone through those. So um, we need to introduce critical thinking early on, at an early age. And I'm talking grade school. So it's integrated into their very way and how they operate and how they think, to be a little bit dubious of what people are telling them, to ask for second choices, to look at what, who told them that, and does that person have any credibility? Ha, I like your comment, Jeff. The age of average is over. Amen, brother. Um, oh, there you are. I heard the online learning question as a, as is actually wiping the data out of the system when it captures data when it isn't supposed to relative to privacy. Yeah, the the um, the ability to f to forget me is an important part of this process. It's a technology challenge um, where 
you're being asked to, you know, it's more about than on learn, it's about forget me, right? I have the right to send a note to um, any institution I deal with and say, I want you to forget me. I want you to take all the information you have about me and wipe it out of your system. Understanding the fact that the services they provided to me may be negatively in, in, impacted by that. But this idea that you have a right to be asked to be forgotten is, is important. But for us who have been in a data space for a long time, know how hard that is for organizations because most organizations, contrary to the uh, what you may be told by folks, is most companies do not have a 360 degree view of their customers. They do not have access to other customer data. So the actual act of, of forgetting somebody is a heinous act in most organizations. Probably can't be done because we've never orchestrated our systems in a way to more easily integrate that. And by the way, I think there's technologies coming along, data virtualization and then data lake houses and, and you know data meshes, these kind of things are gonna help us try to solve this problem. But today, organizations would have are having a hard time if that forget me becomes a law. Dan responds. Yeah, that's a, I don't know how we get out of the LLM. I'll be honest with you. We, we can't even get it out of our customer relationship management systems. And which is, you know, LLMs are much more opaque, um, uh, or, you know, it's obscure. I, uh, it's much more cloudy. I, I, I think it's a really hard problem how to, how to unlearn me or how to forget me. Yeah, Ray, you can. Um, one of the things I've been doing with 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 AI. So your question is, can I ask? Can I actually ask AI if I give it a business situation, right? Which, by the way, you need to feed it. You need to feed it a business situation. You got to feed it your situation. Which sometimes takes because uh, Bing only takes four thousand characters unless you find the hack. Um, um, takes a while to set up. So you got to thread and you set up your business situation. You can actually ask your generative AI, what are some potential unintended consequences? It's actually really useful. It, it will give you some things that actually are good and some things that don't make any sense. But even if it gives you 10 things and if only one of them is good, that's one more than you had when you started before you asked the question. So that I think that's a perfect way to leverage something like a generative AI tool is you ask good questions and then you apply your critical thinking to say, well, is that real? And it will come up with ideas. And that's the best way to use something like that is to help help augment your thinking, help you to be more creative in thinking about these sort of things. Good question. Oh, doing a good job, to Shahar. You got complimented. Question. Data is inherently biased. It is heavily dependent on the source. Do you worry about these Emma models and Cleveland models becoming echo chambers? Yes, I do. Um, I think that's the that's one of the big worries with um, confirmation bias. We tend to um, we tend to create a, an echo chamber effect, and so making sure that we have we getting rid of the bias in the data. I don't know how practical it is. I just don't know. But getting rid of the bias in the models is something that we can control. And that's probably where I would focus, is making sure that my models are set up so I'm not, in, not, not seeking out those biases in the data, that I'm building my models in a way to avoid this. So I know what my protected classes are. I can make sure I don't put those in my models, right? I know what the proxy measures that indicate protected classes. I can also make sure I don't put those in there as well. So I don't know if I can actually move biases in the data, but I think and I believe I have a chance to actually build models that can learn to ignore those kind of protected classes bias and still deliver meaningful and relevant outcomes. Do we have do we have time for another uh, another uh, giveaway? We're almost near the end here, and um, I hope this has been useful. Uh, it's been great having the questions. Do we want to do another raffle? I think we've got um, four minutes left. Everybody's been typing in hashtag packed. Last time to do it, because here we go. Raffle time. Barat corrects. Congratulations. All right, well, I, I want to thank everybody for the questions today, the conversation. Um, I want to thank my 
my friends. Um, I guess I did one question. One last question. What's next for me? What's next for you, Bill? That's a good question. Um, probably won't be a book. What I'm actually working on is a master class. I'm working on a master class for um, two different kinds of master classes. One is my <clears throat> the art of thinking like a data scientist, my big data MBA kind of traditional one. But I'm also going to be working on a master class around this book and what I'm learning the part of the process. So um, probably not a book, but the next chapter of my life is to to apply and give back. I, I've been very fortunate in my life um, that a lot of things have been given to me, a lot of opportunities have been presented to me. And I think the last chapter that the next chapter, not my last chapter, hope not. My next chapter is about making sure that I'm giving back. So um, probably be working on, I will be working on master classes, already started that process. Um, it's fun. I love working with my students. I love working with my clients. Every one of these situations provides a learning opportunity. And by the way, I hope this was also a learning opportunity for all of you because I, I learned a ton from the questions you asked. And I look forward to our continuing collaboration as we work our way through this AI opportunity together. Cheers.